When you're there, say amen. We'll wait on your brother, Kevin. Oh, you beat everybody this time? <laughs> uh, should be on the screen any second. There we go. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as a spirit gave them utterance. I want to address a simple thought. One accord. Stretch your hands this way and let's pray that the Lord will have his way in this meeting. Father, I love you, Jesus. Lord, I pray that you touch us in this meeting. I pray that you would anoint me to preach your word, anoint ears to hear and minds to understand, touch hearts to obey, and our spirit to grab a hold of what you have for us today. Touch us around these altars. Let us be representations of you and your kingdom. And all that is done in us and through us, we will give you honor, glory, and praise for it. In Jesus' mighty name. And all that loved him shouted, Amen. The Gospel of Luke's, or Luke's Gospel, sorry. His last verses close with the Lord telling his disciples that they would be baptized with the Holy Ghost. He tells 500 to go to Jerusalem and wait to be given power. But only 120 make it to the upper room. Out of 500 of the followers that were with Jesus, only 24% make it to the upper room. That's sad. But the Lord will raise the remnant, right? In the opening books of Acts, the Lord has told his followers that they would be witnesses for him. But they had to have power to do so. You will receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That's the promise that the 120 are given. So they travel to Jerusalem, and they wait for 10 days in the upper room. In a 10-day prayer meeting, they are praying for the promise. I would have to assume that they didn't even know what they were asking for. They didn't even know what they were there for. They're, that's it. They are waiting for the Holy Ghost. They are waiting for power. For what purpose? To do the job Jesus has set before them. They are of one accord. What is one accord really? It means to be of one mind, unity. They are together in prayer. They are in one mind with one goal, and that's God's kingdom. Their focus is on Jesus only. The 380 that left made up their minds that they had followed Jesus as far as they were willing to go. Right? Yeah, we see you. We see what you're doing. Yeah, we ain't going there. We don't worry about no power. We don't want to go and spend 10 days in an upper room. But the 120 were willing to go all the way. They were not worried about who was there and who was not there. They were not saying, well, James yelled at me the other day, so he shouldn't be here. Peter smells like fish. Why is he in charge? Matthew was a tax collector. I lost my house because of him. I'm leaving. No one was upset because John didn't talk to him on Wednesday. They were all in one mind. They were in one accord. They were a kingdom, a family. Let's get real. If I look at myself... I'm task-driven, no doubt. And I will do whatever it takes to get the job done. I don't always talk to everyone. Sometimes I don't talk to anyone. It doesn't mean that I, I don't love anyone in my family any less. And that goes for my church family as well. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It doesn't mean that I'm mad at you that day. It just means that I'm in a zone. Amen? If you've, if, you, if you've never been in there, in that mindset, I can't explain it to you. 
When I would go to the gym, a guy would come to me and he'd say, hey, man, you always look so mad. What? I'm not mad. Man, you're just, you're just like going after it. Dude, I'm, I'm focused. I'm driven. That's, that's me. I'm not mad. I'm just driven. I got something. I got stuff to do. That's just how I'm wired. But I can tell you this. If someone tried to come in here and we were going to hurt any one of y'all, I would lay down my life. Not just for Brother Jamie. Not just for my family, but for my church family. You would probably say something like this, well, I could take care of myself, and you probably can. I'm not disputing that. But I know what I'm capable of. I know what I can do. So don't think for a second that I don't love anybody in our church. I love the youngest to the oldest, to the newest, to the most seasoned. But I will tell you this. You have no idea what I go through. You have no idea what I had to drag in here tonight or any time I get on this platform. In one hand, I have the load of heaven in this gospel to do the Lord's work, to bring water to a dry and dying land. And in the other hand, the weight of hell, the past that haunts me, my inabilities, the fact that hell doesn't want me up here. If I ignore you, it wasn't on purpose. You have no idea what I have going on. And that goes for any minister, any child of God, anybody in our family. Amen? That's why we always must walk in the Spirit. It's not about you. It's about the kingdom. We got to get out of our feelings. We have to look past our flesh and the flesh of our others. Discernment plays a very, very important role. You have to know when to stay when to walk away, when to speak, when not to speak, in the spirit, not in our flesh. The flesh will get you into trouble every time. We must be in one accord. Let's look at the life of Jesus. He handpicked the disciples, all of them. I'm going to emphasize all of them. None of them came by chance. They didn't just happen to stumble across. Hey, can I be in your 12? Didn't work that way. They were all chosen. So was Judas. Judas was chosen. You can't tell me that Jesus didn't know who was going to betray him while he was chosen to, while he was choosing the 12. You can't tell me that. You can't tell me he didn't already know what was going to happen. Amen. So Judas comes along, and Jesus welcomes him into the fold, not just into the mass of followers, but into the 12 disciples. Then he says, hey, why don't you take care of our money? What? That's crazy, Lord, but that's being in the Spirit. And for three years, Judas walked with Jesus, saw what he did, saw the miracles, saw the healings, Heard him teach, still, after all that, sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Mm -mm -mm. And Jesus knew all along who would give him up, and the Lord still chose Judas to walk beside him for three years. Talk about love. Talk about compassion. Talk about commitment. None of us would do that. Hey, let's be real. None of us would do that. We would run for the hills screaming. We would say, Father, here's this cup. I'm out. Amen? Let's look at it for real. There would never be a nevertheless. We would be gone. We would hightail it out of town. But like a smooth running army, we have to be in one mindset, one goal. The devil's army has one goal. And that is to stop you from being all God wants you to be. All, all of us. All. He don't want us to be even close to the Lord. But if you skate there, he's going to put up barriers and try to block you from becoming all that you can be. We have to have the mindset of the Lord to finish the job, no matter the cost. Jesus walked beside Judas for three years. Not once 
did the Lord pray, remove this man from my presence. I don't read that anywhere, did you? They traveled together. They laughed together. They ate together. And Judas still betrayed the Lord. And the Lord still loved him. I believe if Judas would have asked for forgiveness, the Lord would have forgave him. We have to love like Jesus loves, to be in one accord. Our focus should be on the Lord and him only. We spend too much time worrying about other people and other stuff. We have to stop. To have that upper room experience, we need to be in unity, a togetherness. We need to be in one accord. The psalmist said it best. Psalms 133, 1 through 3. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garment as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forevermore. When we dwell together in unity, in one accord, the oil from heaven will pour down upon us. The wind from heaven will blow upon us. The spirit will inhabit us. When I read the Bible, I always wonder. I always have questions. Does anybody else have questions? I was like, some of them are goofy. It's just me. I wonder what the 120 were doing in the upper room. Were they playing games, cards, backgammon? Were they talking about the day they had? Were they eating and having a good time? I don't think so. I think they were fasting and praying. Probably took them 10 days to get their minds focused on the Lord, right? To get them to seeking the face of God. I'm sure there was probably some grief in there. They were fasting. Fasting is not about getting something from the Lord, but letting him do something in us. The longer we fast, the more he can do. Fasting breaks the physical, makes the flesh weak while at the same time bringing the spiritual man out and giving him the Lord's strength. When we are weak, then he is strong. That is Pentecost. Why is is fasting fasting such a bad word? We hear fast and we about faint at the thought of it. Right? Amen? The body wants fuel. It needs to eat, correct? That's just on the physical side. It has to have it has to have fuel. But do we consume food because everything else we used to consume is a sin? And so then food is the only thing we can consume, and so we consume it till it becomes a sin. Something to think about. So the hundred and twenty, they're in the upper room for ten days. How long is ten days really? A week and a half, 240 hours, 14,400 minutes, 864,000 seconds. That's how long they waited for the promise of the Father. And we find it hard to write out 10 minutes of prayer. We want God to move on our timetable. Baby, it ain't going to work that way. We say stuff like, okay, Lord, if you don't do something by the time I'm done praying, I guess you're not moving. You must be asleep. That kind of thinking will get us into trouble. If we want Pentecost, we will have to get in a place where nothing else matters, where it is Jesus only. And like Jacob, I'm not leaving until you touch me. That's our mindset. That's what it has to be. I'm not leaving till you touch me. Till your spirit dwells in this vessel, till we are one accord. There is life and death in the upper room. The flesh dies and the spirit lives. Too many times we are waiting on a healing, but not the healer. We want the blessing, but not the blesser. Is that even a word? It is now. Oh, we want the power but not the one who supplies the power. 
Amen. Something to think about. I don't know. The day of Pentecost is a celebration of when the Spirit came down and God gave Moses, Moses the law. We know Pentecost is the day God brought his Spirit upon man. Pentecost brings the fruit of the Spirit. Pentecost brings the gifts of the Spirit. Pentecost brings the power to witness, power to deliver, power to bind, and power to loose. But it also brings a oneness with the Spirit, a unity with God, a unity with with God's will. It also brings a revelation of Christ, a revelation needed to help a lost and dying world. Pentecost brings revival. If you have seen the news feed over the past few months, you no doubt have seen all the mass shootings taking place. They are happening all over the United States, Texas, California, uh, Indiana, I can't remember the rest of them. Not only mass shootings, but senseless killings. I read a man in Florida orders Uber Eats. And when his food gets there, him and the delivery driver get into a dispute over a $2 charge that the delivery driver had no control over. It was Uber Eats app that charged him 2 bucks, So they get into an altercation and the dude kills him. Then he chops him into pieces. That's the world we live in. A man down south stabs a woman in her apartment. The cops find the baby in a retention pond in an alligator's mouth. A couple weeks later, they discover that the two-year-old was killed by the man who stabbed his mother choked him to death, and then threw him in the pond. Sad. This world needs Pentecost, but the church has to have it first. People say, why isn't the church doing anything? Because the church has lost its power. The real church, the church that Jesus left and is coming back for, that church the world is sick with sin, and the evil is it is in it is running rampant. Turn on the news. I don't even turn on watching the news except for the weather half the time. Most of the stories that I just told you came across my phone. I'll be at work. It's just the way it is. I'm gonna read you something. Revelation seventeen and three. Actually, one through three, sorry. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her the kings of the earth commit adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was woman was dressed in that's not even dressed in purple and scarlet and was and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She she held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. Don't do it now, but I want you to go home and you're going to Google 2002, 2022 Commonwealth Games in England. What you'll find is the ceremony for these games had a whole people in the stadium worshiping a big metal beast was motorized. It had a woman riding on its back. She was wearing white, and the arraignment of colors that they had going on reflected off of her 
white garment and it reflected purple and red. You think I'm crazy? Go home and look it up. Don't tell me it's not getting nuts. Don't tell me Jesus ain't coming back soon. We should know what the back of the book says. As soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, that's not good. The devil is getting geared up for one last push before Christ returns. We should be doing the same. And the only way that that happens is through Pentecost, through the oneness of his spirit by one accord. The oneness of his spirit. It's doing some hard things. It's walking in a will. 2017, the Lord came to me and he said, step out and I will take care of you. I don't know if I can do that, Lord. Actually, I didn't, I'll I'll move back up because I didn't actually answer it the first time I ignored it. I didn't hear that. The second time, what are you asking? Step out, and I will take care of you. At the time I worked a job, 25 years, I made $100,000 a year. I had full reign, full control. I had six guys underneath me. I did a lot. It's a lot of money. The Lord wants me to step out. Where am I going? You know where you're going. So I stepped out. I left. The Lord retired me, and I stepped into a job making half of that. About five months later, the Lord said, step out, and I will take care of you. Where are we going? Step out. All right, here we go. Actually, my response was, you're going to have to take care of Amanda. You're going to have to deal with that. I'm just going to do what you want me to do. So I did. Stepped out into nothing. She worked. I didn't. The Lord provided. And then some. He took care of all our bills. We paid a bill off. We took care of Draven when he was out of work and a whole other family. The Lord can do it. When you walk in his will. With that said, I ended up down the road where I'm at. I get increasingly frustrated. The guy who who owns the business, he would rather be fishing than be at work. I think he fishes four days out of the work week and is actually at work one. It's overly frustrating. I don't know what we're doing. What's going on? He don't answer the phone. Customers come in and, hey, man, so-and-so here. Nope. You know when he'll be in? Nope. Well, I try to call him. Yeah, good luck with that. Man, can you call him? He ain't going to answer for me either, dude. Sorry. It's just the way it is. I try to sell myself. It pays the same whether you fight nor marching. But sometimes it gets old. It just gets old. I'm task-driven. So standing around doing this drives me up the wall. Lord, I don't know what you're trying to teach me, but it's getting old. So some friends of mine, they started the shop, and they call me up, and they say, hey, man, we want to talk to you about coming to, coming to work for us. Now, they're believers. That is a plus. I'm like, yeah, why not? I'm not making a commitment. I'm just showing up. So that was a job interview that I I talked about during service. And I go and I have lunch with them, and I talk to them, and I basically tell them, well, dude, make me an offer. You're not going to insult me. Just make me an offer, and we'll go from there. Okay. About a week later, they come back with an offer, and they say, hey, man, we'll pay you this. We want you to do this, and this is what this is what we want. How how if you commit, how long do you think you would take? Ah, give me about two or three weeks if I commit. But first of all, I'm going to pray and fast. That's what's going to happen. Oh, yeah, man. 
that, no doubt. We're all believers here. We understand that. Uh, so you have to also understand that with my job now, there is a lot of freedom. I have a lot of freedom. I can take two days off. I could take a week off. I could probably take a whole month off. It, I have a lot of freedom. This is more of a commitment. I'm just telling you, I don't know. I, I have to ask the Lord about it. So that's what I did. I prayed and fasted. Got my answer. I called him up. I said, uh, hey, man, uh, you're not going to like my answer. I said, but the Lord's not going to let me go. I actually thought about that statement, and I said, oh, wait a minute. That sounds bad, don't it? Uh, no, I'm right. The Lord's not going to let me go. I'm in his will. That's where I'm at. He won't let me go. Oh, man. I'm like, look, dude, I know I get entirely, I'm extremely frustrated at certain things that happen over there. No doubt. Do I want out? You betcha. I want more structure. I want to see some growth. I want it to flourish. When you want something, when you want more for somebody than they want for themselves, it's tough. It's tough on you. I know what I can make the business. He has no he has no drive. He doesn't want to do it. He makes enough money to pay me and another guy and himself and Keep the doors open. He don't care. <sighs> All right, dude. Whatever. I can't. I can't do it for you. They said, "Well, man, you know, uh, we could really." I said, "Look, dude. I could leave. There's no doubt. I could leave over there and go to work for you, but that's not that's not the Lord's will. He told me to be still." And the way only thing that I can think of is Joseph didn't pray for the pit, did he? He was stuck in the pit, but he didn't pray for the pit. Nobody prays for the pit. But if Joseph could got himself out, would he have done it? Probably. So in my brain, I'm thinking I'm trying to get myself out of something, but the Lord has work to do here and is using this for something. I have no idea to fully disclose that. I can speculate. I can't tell you. Not with, sh not for sure. Knowing, knowing what I do know, the Lord works in multi-faucets. They said, all right, man. I was, just uh, If you change your mind, just remember what I said. The Lord told me to be still. It'll come. But that's the mindset, right? And that's where we have to be. We have to be one with the Spirit to know where to go or we're going to make a wrong turn. I read a story. I heard a story. I want to say that. I don't think I actually read it. I think I heard it. It's, it's in a book, but I didn't read it. Somebody was telling it to me. I believe, if I remember right, a lady is in England, we'll say that, because I can't exactly remember, but there's another lady in the U.S., and a lady in England is walking, and she's walking down the road, she's leaving from somewhere, and another lady gets woke up, same time, the lady wakes up, now she has a burden on her heart for this lady, so she starts to pray. Oh, I don't, I don't know. Just pray for her. So she starts to pray for her. She prays and she prays and she prays. What she finds out later on is that as the lady is walking home, somebody falls in behind her. She gets an eerie feeling, so she realizes that she needs to pick up the pace. So where she's walking, it's at night, it's dark, she can't see who it is. She says, 
she tells later on, the Holy Ghost would tell her, turn right, turn left, speed up, turn right again, turn right, left. And she lost her attacker. Now, I believe in the story they were, they had a, there was a, I don't remember if it was a rapist or a mugger or something that was going on in that area at that time. That's what being in the spirit is. That's what walking in the spirit, that's what the the oneness with the mind of Christ. Pentecost brings that a oneness with Christ. So you can say, nevertheless, your will be done. If you're not in one accord with the spirit, you're going to act in the flesh. That's how we do dumb stuff. And then we get ourselves into trouble. Lord, I did it again. Can you help me out? Walk in the Spirit. Be one with the Spirit. You don't like your world? Change it. You can't change it? No, Pentecost will. It'll change how you view your world you're in. Amen? The 120 are in the upper room. What just happened? Jesus ascended. They're left without a teacher. They're going to go up in there. They don't really know what they're after, what they're supposed to be doing. All they know is Jesus said go. So they go. The world's already been turned upside down. Jesus is gone. They're probably grief-stricken. Here's the Messiah. The kingdom didn't quite come as they thought it was going to be. Lord, what's going to happen to us? Because even though Jesus told them to go, it still didn't stop the fact that they were going to be killed and they were hunted. So they're in the they're in the upper room waiting. How big was this upper room that there was 120 people in it? That's what I want to know. I had to have been like, was it a room like this or was it a room like the fellowship hall? Were they all like squeezed together? That's where my brain goes. Like they don't, some stuff they leave out of the, not everything's in the book. But they're in the upper room. What were they doing? They're praying and they're fasting. They were worshiping the Lord Almighty. There was no band playing. There was no one preaching. Just them concerned for one thing. We've heard a lot about what Pentecost brings. But what brings Pentecost? The praises of his people. A mind on nothing else but the Lord. One accord with one goal. Pentecost brings life, gifts, a oneness, revelation, and power. Let's be real. Right? You want to be real? What has happened to the church? And not just our church. You see it all over the country. Fall by the wayside. We were all, we, we were told that a lot of people would would leave. It was a core group that has to raise the remnant. That's the remnant, that core group is what the was what the Lord is going to bring back. But look all over. The church as a whole is dying. It's almost like it's being squeezed to death. One by one, we fall off. It saddens me, really, because I read in this book what they did when they come out of that upper room. My Lord. We want Pentecost. Let me rephrase that. We want what Pentecost brings, but are we willing to do what it takes to bring Pentecost? Love, 
a love for each other, a love for the lost, a love for the Lord, a love for his spirit. When I read off, a lot of the times, I'm going to ask some questions. wish I could talk to people. I'd ask Peter, Peter, what was it like? What was it like being in the upper room? What was it like when the spirit fell? What was it like when you came downstairs and preached and 3,000 souls were saved? What was it like when you went to Cornelius' house? What was it like? Paul, what was it like when you were beat with rods and you laughed? Or when you were thrown in jail and you were in the stocks and you all just started singing and the spirit fell and you were released? What was that like? What was that like, Paul? Or how about John? What was that like? What was that like being boiled in oil and you're not dying? What was that like? What was that like to be so full of the Spirit? What was that like? What was that like to be on the island of Patmos? Now for sure you think you're going to die. You've been exiled. What was it like to be taken up and be given the scenes from Revelation. What was that like? I would even go as far as Smith. I want to talk to Smith. Smith, what was it like? What was it like to stand in a congregation of 3,000 people and pray and watch them all be healed? What was it like to tell a man that was in a wheelchair and had no, he was an amputee, to tell him what I want you to do is go to the shoe store and get fitted for shoes. What was that like? And then the man goes to get fitted for shoes, and the clerk looks at him like he's crazy. Uh, Sir, what kind of shoes would you want? What kind of size? Uh, Can you give me a number? Size 8, please. So the man brings... (laughs) He brings the man in a wheelchair of the shoes. The man in a wheelchair pulls him out. He puts his little nub in there. Bam! Both legs grow instantaneous. What was that like? What was that like when Smith walked down the streets of California? I think it was San Francisco. There were so many people that were were seeking the Lord in a healing that he walked down the streets with his hand and when his shadow passed him, they were all healed. The story that I read was there was a family and a little girl had some kind of blood disease and if I'm not mistaken, it's leukemia. And as Smith was walking, they were praying and they had their eyes closed and the little girl and the parents are on the sidewalk. And Smith is walking down the center of the street, and they could hear one by one coming to them how people were getting healed, and they were rejoicing, and they were, they were glorifying God, and they were laughing, and they were jumping and screaming, and they were one by one in their anticipation. And they're like, oh, is it going to be us? Is it going to be us? And when the Spirit fell on them, they were all touched. The little girl was healed. The mom and dad were touched. What was that like, Smith? What was that like? That's my question. What was that like? If the book of Acts continued, actually, somebody do me a favor. What is the last chapter? I believe it's 28, but I'm not, ex- I'm not. What was that like? That oneness, being in one accord. What was it like to see those miracles? Sister Gilda, what was it like when you were a little girl and you saw the church services that they used to have? Mom would tell us about services they had when they were a little girl. We don't, 
The stuff that we see now is just a drop in the bucket. It's nothing compared to what God can pour out. Nothing. We don't see the revivals that lasted nine weeks. We don't see those anymore. Is God different? He sure isn't. So if God hasn't changed, then who changed? We have. We're busier. Nobody wants to well, nobody wants to pay that price. That's the price that we're gonna have to pay for Pentecost. And I'm not talking about just a a Friday night revival Pentecost. I'm talking about full blown Pentecost. Where the where this is our upper room and when the doors open, all of Middleburg is saved, healed. All of Keystone, the spirit has, it just pours out. This building won't be able to contain it. That's the Pentecost that I'm talking about. Not just a little touch and we run around and and we speak in tongue. I'm talking about a full-fledged move of the spirit. Is that what you want? That's what Pentecost brings. Pentecost is going to bring all of that, but we have to bring Pentecost. We have to pray and fast, cry out to the Lord. Anybody find it yet? What's the last chapter in Acts? 28? What if it didn't stop in 28? What if, like, in the 30s was chapter, we'll say, 29 to 30? And in the 40s, and it kept going. And it goes and it goes. So if you did the math, two chapters per 10 years, uh, was that 20 chapters, right? No. I can't do that math fast. Is it Trenny? thought I was right. So what chapter would we be on then? So if we stopped at 20, it would be a 48. Chapter 48, 2023, we pick up the book. Our page is blank, correct? Because we haven't wrote it yet. But ten years later, somebody picks up the book and says, Oh, Acts of the Apostles. Well, here we go. Man. I just read where Middleburg Church of God lit the whole world on fire. Amen. Is that what we all seek? Not just the healing, not just the touch. Lord, bless me if you can. A full fledged immersement. That's what I'm praying for. That the spirit would fall so heavy that we would all be laid out or so drunk in the spirit, we ain't working for the next three weeks. That's what I'm praying for. But it's going to take some stuff on our part, right? If you'll stand, I'll close with this. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house to sacrifice. If I shut up heaven, that there will be no rain. Or if I command the locusts to devour the land. Or if I send pestilence among my people. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will hear their lands. We are not waiting on the Lord. He is waiting on us. Let's bring Pentecost. Let's be in one accord. Let's be like the acts of the apostles in the upper room. Who wants that upper room experience? Come on and join me around these altars. Father, I pray that your message has touched hearts and minds. I pray that your will is done tonight and in days to come. Jesus, I love you. Let your spirit burn in us. Let it burn through us till we are all a flame of fire in your holy name. Amen. Come on and join me.